Hi everyone, this is Trevor Jones and this is the Astro Backyard. Tonight I'm going to photograph a beautiful emission slash reflection nebula in the constellation Cygnus known as the Cocoon Nebula. This vibrant nebula has always fascinated me and I continue to go after it year after year. It's a fantastic target for you to try this spring and summer because it looks good at almost any focal length. Punchy red hydrogen, colorful stars, and a dusty tail. This one's got it all. This time around, I hope to capture this nebula in better detail than ever before. I'll use a color camera and some great new tools that I think you're really gonna like to get the job done. So, grab a cold one, and please join me for another night of deep sky astrophotography here in the backyard. Ah, springtime. I feel like a bear waking up from hibernation. I have a lot more astro energy than I did in the winter and I think it's because a lot of my favorite deep sky targets are returning. We're still currently in galaxy season and the disk of the Milky Way, including the area of the night sky that I'm shooting tonight, doesn't rise until the wee hours of the morning, but that's okay. I'll sleep when I'm dead. The Cocoon Nebula is one of the earlier deep sky nebulae you can capture. The constellation Cygnus the Swan rises in the east earlier and higher than the core of the Milky Way to the south. So it's usually the first area I go after in the early spring and summer. I'm hoping to collect some serious light on the cocoon tonight using a multi-band pass filter. I debated shooting it in the broad spectrum without a filter tonight because it's new moon, but I was thinking it might be nice to get some real good pop to that hydrogen in the nebula. The object is classified as a cluster of magnitude 9.5 stars involved in a bright and dark nebula. The cluster of stars in the cocoon are beautiful indeed, but it's that glowing hydrogen gas and reflection areas that get my heart pumping. And there's a noticeable tail of dust that follows this glowing region. It blocks out a path on a sea of stars. I love me some dust. The field of view created by the telescope I'm using tonight will allow me to capture plenty of surrounding space around that primary nebula. Without being presumptuous, I believe that this is closer to the scale that most of you will be capturing the cocoon at. This one has a focal length of just over a thousand millimeters, but I'm using a 0.7 reducer to bring it closer to 700. To get really up close and personal to this 12 arc minute wide nebula, you'll need a big telescope with a focal length of at least 2000 millimeters. I'm also going to collect some data in my personal observatory tonight, an even wider field target. This one's a surprise I've been secretly working on for about a month, and you'll see it if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter. What the? Where's the observatory? Ash, the observatory is gone. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, I took down the observatory. And we're moving. After three and a half years living in this house, we have decided to pack up our things and move to the country. Sort of. Technically, we're still in the city, but it's on the outskirts of town with more space. Both kinds. And most importantly, a new spot for the Black Dog Observatory. Rudy is so excited. Aren't you, buddy? So I have two scopes running tonight and I have to bring them both inside when I'm done so potential buyers can see our house in non-astro mode tomorrow. This feels really weird. Maybe we should have listed it as an astronomer's dream backyard and just left everything where it was. Of course, this is all happening on the first stretch of consecutive clear nights of this year and during new moon. The real kick in the grind was tearing down the no longer permanent pier and robotic telescope mount in the observatory. It's running better than ever right now. Now, so why not disassemble it? Story of my life. 
but that's not till tomorrow morning. I have one more night with the observatory mount and telescope. I probably won't set up the Paramount again until we move into the new place in two months. So kind of bittersweet, a final last light, if you will. This video was sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of online classes and members across 150 countries. It's a place to get inspired, learn new skills, and put them to work. I myself have spent several hours absorbing useful information on Skillshare courses. If you're like me, you like to listen and learn from inspiring people on your downtime. I'm currently taking the advanced video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro course by fellow YouTuber Jordi Vandeput. Vandeput? Jordi. He's kind of a genius when it comes to Premiere, and this is something I personally want to get better at this year. You guys knew I used Premiere for my videos, right? Completely self-taught. Until now, I guess. The courses are all ad-free, super professional, searchable, with new premium classes added each week. If you want to check it out, the first 1,000 of my subscribers that use the link in the description or the code ASTROBACKYARD will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. This is pretty interesting, I think so anyway. So I was able to capture data on the Cocoon Nebula through a multi-band pass filter, the Triad Ultra. So pretty strong filter that isolates the narrow band details. And then I also shot it again the following night without a filter, just to shoot it in broadband. And we're gonna compare the two data sets here so you can see the big differences that these filter make. Uh, the first one here, this is the uh, multi-band pass narrowband filter data. And I'll just do a quick screen transfer function so you can see what's in there. So you can see the, the layering there. It's two nights worth of data. It's funny, it's actually about the same amount of integration time for both sets. So great to compare. So here's the, the multi-band pass filter. Of course, you can see that really dynamic cocoon nebula in there and in some of the dust and you can even see some of the underlying red hydrogen gas behind the nebula so really cool to see it like that but of course those stars are a lot less natural and colorful using a filter like that so when we look at the broad spectrum data here's what it looks like with a quick stretch so this was a different telescope a bit of a wider field view but still able to combine this data together for a great photo but look how much bigger those stars are they're you know, a lot more bloated of course there's no filter in there and you can still see the nebula but it just doesn't have that same punch that the other one does what this one does have though is more natural looking star colors so you can see some more of those blues in there and even the the orange is a little more natural looking and even some of the soft blues around the cocoon so that was the that was the point of shooting it this way now there's going to be some major processing involved not just the scaling to get them to match but also taking the best elements of each image and combining them so the punchiness of the multi-band pass narrow band version and then the natural stars of the broadband version and I'll have to do some star minimizing and there's gonna be some magic in there but these are the two data sets I use to create the final image and hopefully that was useful to you to uh, see this the differences between the two filters man this video was kind of all over the place I realized that to be honest I wasn't really ready to share the big news that we're moving and maybe you don't really care that much but that missing dome kind of gave it away so the cat's out of the bag Anyway, I'm just excited about a slightly darker backyard and all of the future adventures we'll have back there. So think of it as a new beginning for all of us because it wouldn't be any fun without you.